Welcome to Shochu 101 with the Japan Sake and Shochu Makers Association and me, Philip Duff. The origins of Shochu can be dated back as far as 1546 when a Portuguese explorer talked about araki that he drank in Japan, meaning distilled alcohol based on rice. In 1559, some workmen on a temple in Japan wrote graffiti complaining that the head priest who'd hired them was so stingy he didn't even give them any shochu. And shochu's birthplace is the Kyushu region around southern Japan and also including the Ruku kingdom centered around Okinawa. Shochu is a Japanese distilled spirit. It's famously made from barley, which is 42% of all the shochu made in Japan for the most recent year we have figures for, sweet potato, about another 45%, rice, sugar cane, or other ingredients. You sacrify it with koji and yeast. The koji, an aspergillus mold, turns the starches of whatever base ingredients it is into sugar, and the yeast, of course, turns that sugar into alcohol. The koji also produces citric acid, which wards off bacterial infections. That's not unimportant considering you're making it in a warm tropical climate. Single distilled honkaku shochu goes one time through a pot still and it's bottled at less than 45%. Continual column still korowai shochu is bottled at less than 36%. And if you make a blend that's got 49% or less of the pot still honkaku, it's called korowai otsurai konwa shochu. And if you make a blend that's got 51% or more pot still honkaku, it's otsurai kuruai konwa. After you've made it, you can rest it in glass, ceramic, steel, or wood, and most of it is bottled and sold at 25%. The ancestor of shochu is from the Ruku Island. It's called Awamori, and it's a black koji, Thai indica rice, single ferment honkaku shochu, bottled at 45%. And because all shochu has no added sugar and no carbohydrates, some people say it doesn't give you a hangover. The raw materials include the famous sweet potato and rice and barley, but you can make it from two dozen different ones, including kelp, sesame, carrot, and even ginger. Koji is the key to understanding shochu. Yellow koji was what shochu was originally made with, but when black koji came to Japan, it was discovered that black koji produced higher levels of acids, which could make for better shochu. shochu. And white koji mutated from black koji sometime in the 1920s. And it's one of the most popular types now as it gives a gentler, sweeter flavor. The koji is inoculated into a host, which is usually rice, and then it's let grow. So this koji room, all those boxes contain aspergillus mold spores growing on probably rice. When they get to a certain size, they're combined with yeast in the first fermentation and they ferment for up to a week going crazy. And then in the second fermentation, you add the base ingredient, rice, sweet potato, barley, whatever it is. You ferment it again. And what you have at the end goes into the still. Believe it or not, this submarine shaped thing is a pot still. But this is also a pot still. And this is also a pot still made from cedar wood. In fact, reduced pressure pot stills like this one here have become popular as they allow you to distill at less than 78 degrees Celsius. Whatever still you use, when the shochu comes out, it's stored in stainless steel or in ceramics. It can also be stored in wooden barrels, of course, or underground. A lot of shochu, including our mori, is stored underground in caves, deep underground. The tradition is you buy a 1.8 liter bottle to mark a particular occasion and the distillery stores it for you. As you can see, this one was for the birth of a child. After five or 10 or 20 years, you go back and open that shochu and enjoy it. There's different ways to drink shochu. Of course, straight up around the rocks, mizuari with water or sodawari with sparkling water, but it's a life-changing thing to drink good shochu with oyawari, hot water. You must try it. Well, that was a brief run through Shochu 101. Thank you for joining me. And please continue your educational journey with the JSS. Come by. Okay, so this is the plum cocktail. Uh, the plum cocktail is inspired by this delicious uh, Genshu uh, Soshu made by Watanabe Distillery in Miyazaki City. Uh, after distillation, uh, this 
Genshu is rested for five years in neutral barrels to really make sure that all those flavors can kind of settle and come together into this delicious, delicious and expressive spirit. Uh, what I really love about the flavors of this particular Genshu is that it has all this kind of like toasted sesame notes and like popcorn flavors from the barley koji uh, that they use as well. So it's a barley Genshu, it's a Mugi Soshu. Also, we're adding a umeboshi tahini syrup. Uh, umeboshi, again, uh, salted ume plum, uh, very tart, reminiscent of apricot in flavor. I'm adding a little bit of this Taiwanese uh, plum vinegar that has wonderful, like this wonderful honey characteristic and bright gentle acidity. Uh, so I'm combining the two of those syrups together. We're going to add a little bit of lemon juice uh, to this cocktail, uh, just to add some freshness and brightness, uh, and then also some Amontillado sherry. I find that sherry works really well in soshu applications just due to the gentle acidity. You know, because again Amontillado has these flavors of like uh, bitter almond, this really kind of nutty characteristic, it works really well again kind of complementing the Genshu. Uh, we have a shiro miso uh, syrup that we're, we were making just by combining shiro miso, some white miso, with simple syrup. Uh, it has this wonderful aromas of like candied pineapple. It's very tropical on the nose, and, and a little bit of that salt really adds nice umami uh, to kind of help kind of dry out the cocktail. You know, and, and because we're utilizing uh, you know, the Genshu Soshu uh, in like a split base application for this cocktail, I'm going to split it with some aged Venezuelan rum, uh, Diplomatico Exclusiva Reserva. It's absolutely delicious because it spends time in oak. It's having all these you know, rich characteristics of like toffee and chocolate and orange. Super great maple. It helps really kind of work well uh, with this Genshu. All right, so let's make the cocktail. Uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to add an egg white to our drink. That's going to add a nice creamy texture and some body. Adding an egg white. You know, when we're, when we're about to shake this cocktail, we're going to dry shake it first to make sure everything is properly emulsified. There we go. Great. Uh, next thing we're going to do, we're going to add a little bit of lemon juice. Again, just we're just brightening up the cocktail, adding just a quarter of an ounce of lemon juice. You're going to get so much acidity from the Amontillado Sherry. Uh, just a half ounce of the Shiro Miso. And a half ounce of that Umeboshi Tahini. Half ounce of the Lustal Los Arcos Amontillado Sherry. And then we'll split the base again with Diplomatico Exclusiva Reserva, one full ounce. And then uh, this delicious barley Genshu. Dry shake first, make sure everything is nicely combined. All right. Then we'll add ice and shake. So I've got this fizz glass right here. I've also got some black sesame that I'm going to utilize as a garnish. almost like a dessert style drink, kind of like a boozy milkshake. Uh, I'm double straining it to make sure that it's some, the texture is just super delicious. I'm not getting any ice jars in my cocktail. And we'll just garnish with a little bit of that black sesame, you know, a little bit of that bitterness. And there you have it, that's the plum cocktail. Wonderful, you know, 
again, uh, the Genshu just, you know, again, you know, this Genshu just kind of like pushes through. You get all these wonderful umami characteristics of sesame and chocolate and toffee and the teeny and the plum. It's wonderful. Uh, I hope you guys check it out. Thanks so much for joining us here today as part of this uh, webinar series with some of the best bartenders in the world making delicious Soshu cocktails. Enjoy. Thank you. Matt, I'm going to have a lot of questions for you about that. That sounds like an incredible, delicious uh, cocktail. Hop over to London from New York and uh, have a drink with Mr. Lion himself. Ryan, mate, you're up. I'm actually going to make a martini for us all. Um, it's one of the drinks I created, and I just figured it was a, a beautiful showcase of the character of the shochu and a really nice way of displaying some of the texture, the flavors, and the versatility as well. It also seems perfect for this time of the day. So I wanted to look at some of the characteristics of a barley shochu. We've got one that's bottled a little higher ABV here. So it's at 43%. And to me, it was a wonderful way of, of opening out both the, you know, like a, like a great classic cocktail will do to highlight the profile of the spirit. Um, so to me, with the barley shochu, it's got this wonderful kind of nuttiness. Everything you'd expect to have as barley as a characteristic. but to me, the beauty of using this compared to other barley spirits is this balance of a florality that it has. It's got a delicacy on the top, but in that classic shochu sense, it's also got this amazing savory profile. It's got a richness and this balance and this weight and creamy texture, but to me, just cried out for a martini. So what I've tried to do is use just a couple of little simple notes around it that lift out the flavors and, and kind of really highlight it in a way that, again, plays up to the, the aromas and the texture. So one of the things I'm going to use as an accent is some uh, kinome leaf or what people might know as prickly ash or sancho leaf. Um, I'm very fortunate to have one of these little trees in my house. It's not the one that's in the background, but it's, it's a wonderful herb that you can, you can start to pick up from some specialist suppliers now. Um, and getting the fresh leaves gives, yes, if you kind of use a lot of it, it gives a little bit of that kind of tingling spice that you might associate with Szechuan peppercorns. Um, but as the leaf, it's got this lovely green citrus note, this floral note that to me is one of the things that I wanted to pick out. So that's going to go in the bottom of our mixing glass. And I'm just going to press it a little. I just want to release some of those oils from the skin, but we're just going to simply stir that through the drink. It's, it's not there to be spicy. It's not there to overtake any of the other flavors. I just want there to be a subtle accent. We're going to use a little bit as a garnish on the top as well, but just a little nod towards some of the flavors. And sticking with some of that kind of floral notes, I'm using just 10 mils. So about two teaspoons or a little under half an ounce in the kind of American money, um, just to give a touch of sweetness in the background. We don't want this to be a sweet martini, but it helps kind of give a little bit more of that rich texture and that floral pop that I wanted to have. And great minds think alike, alongside with Matt, I'm gonna use a little touch of sherry, a little cleaner profile for this. Instead of using something like an Amontillado or, or an Oloroso, I'm using a Fino sherry. Bone dry, it's got that really nice kind of green olive note. And that to me is a wonderful match for the savory aspect of, a, of, of the shochu. So about a tablespoon, so 15 mils, about half an ounce. And that's going to give a little bit of a bridge towards these other flavors and help dry the drink out against the sweetness of the liqueur. And then the heart of it, we're going to use a little over an ounce and a half, so 40 mils of our shochu. And really simply, like a martini wants to be, we're just going to stir this over some ice and open out the spirit and make sure it's got enough room to breathe and just really giving a chill and making sure that all of the flavors and all of that texture within the shochu are preserved. So I wanna make sure it's got enough of a dilution and allowing those oils that are within the Sancho leaf to start to leach into the martini. So we get this lovely kind of green floral backdrop to the flavor of the shochu. 
that out. Some nice little pretty martini glass here. Train this out, and it's going to be a perfect little aperitif, or if it's post uh, lunchtime as you are in London here, lovely little afternoon treat. And just using a little bit of that canome leaf just as a garnish. So, Sancho Martini, cheers to you all. I think it's time for a little chat with Ryan and Matt. And I'm going to start with you, Matt. Also, Chicago will need to unmute Matt and Ryan. So you uh, said something that makes perfect sense and you understand it completely, Matt, but perhaps you'd like to explain it for everybody what Genshu means. Uh, Genshu is a soju that is not diluted. Uh, so it's at 40% ABV. Um, it, whereas most soju is around, I think, Philip, you can correct me if I'm wrong, it's around 25% ABV. Yep. Uh, so uh, it's a little bit lighter which is, makes it so versatile for food pairing and just enjoying on itself. Once it has a little bit of dilution, as Philip was talking, the traditional ways that it's enjoyed, either you know with water or served over ice or with hot water, it really kind of brings down the overall ABV. Uh, very similar to like what wine does as we're enjoying it with uh, dinner. So it drops overly uh, down to a much more pleasurable uh, ABV to enjoy with food and with dinner and with uh, friends after work. Yeah, I mean, that is a fantastic sounding drink. I wish I was there to have it with you. And it's all built around the plum, which is really important in Japan. So much so that here's your factoid for today. A Japanese plum liqueur is the fourth or fifth best selling liqueur on the planet, right? It just goes absolutely bananas. But there's also something that you used the shiro miso that reminded me one of the first times, if not the first time you and I ever met in New York, Ryan, you were doing a consultancy that in many ways was a dry run for uh, Lioness in, was it the Hudson Hotel? It was up in uh, Midtown, in exactly that. And I remember because you had, it was a place that used to be, you know, bling and bottle service girls and all that. And you actually had the staff making incredibly complicated drinks. And it feels like about a hundred years ago, but you <laughs> had a caramel miso as an ingredient in a cocktail then. And I thought, wow, that's ballsy. Yeah, it was, it was a really fun, as you say, it was a, a bit of a test run for, for the relationship. It was also a precursor to some of the things that we did at, at Dandelion and at Lioness. Um, but miso has always been something that's that's kind of really fascinated me. You know, working with a few different chefs and, and kind of food scientists over the years, um, really kind of not only looking at it as a, you know, koji as a transformative ingredient, but what it makes is this end product in in different types of misos as well. So, yeah, we've we've played around a lot of it in, in our cocktails, both in, in terms of trying to make our own or adapting, you know, a, a, a store-bought miso to use as an ingredient but I think it's that balance of that sweet and kind of savory depth to it that you know I know Matt and I have had like numerous conversations about this about what it can bring to kind of a variety of different drinks even you know from those sour style drinks that can use a little bit of that savory depth to the one I did in in Hudson which was using it more as a kind of richer old-fashioned style serve. Yeah and just for anybody who's uh, just joined us the link between shochu and miso and soy sauce is of course koji right and i think everybody's gone pretty deep down the rabbit hole of koji um ryan you and don lee perhaps a little deeper than most but if i return to that cocktail that you made it's i think it's a great example of a design principle that's called maya most advanced yet acceptable because everyone's heard of a martini right and they might like a martini or, or they might not but if you make something that have, shares some of the same uh, appearances and flavor tones, you'll get them to try something completely new, which is shochu, right? And I definitely see a bit of a, a thing. I suspect you're the kind of person who might use some Bianco vermouth in a tea as opposed to uh, dry oh, vermouth, am I right? Yeah. Oh, I love it. And it's, as you say, it's, it's, it's making it accessible and it's grounding it in something 
that people are familiar with. You know, it's it's perhaps not the most traditional serve for, for how you might enjoy a shochu, but I think both grounding it in a classic white spirit serve. So it's something that people have come across where they're experiencing the texture of a vodka martini or the botanicals within a gin martini. It's, it's helping them kind of realize what shochu brings to the table, but it's also giving them a point of reference. You know, it is a serve that people will be kind of willing to try because they've tried a martini before. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. Trying to find a way of, of helping them enter a new category through a familiar serve is, is a wonderful way of, of, of bringing people to, into the fold and helping them, I suppose, love shochu as much as we all do. Well, that's it. And I mean, Matt, it's the same question in a way for you, because you have worked in a variety of different bars and now in, of course, one of the world's very best fine dining restaurants and bars, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the very first recipient of the world's best restaurant bar award, the Tales of the Cocktail, was EMP. And obviously Japanese food and Japanese cuisine is revered, but EMP has a bit of a different style. How is it introducing shochu to people? Is it put it on the menu? Is it have a little chat, see if people like funky flavors? What works best for you? I think it's kind of like piggybacking on what Ryan said. I think most of us in uh, that are professional bartenders right now in the world, what we do is we like to introduce flavors to people in a setting that is familiar to them. So what he's talking about, on how he's got a martini that essentially is a martini. However, he's using soju as a spirit, you know, on EMP in the fall before, I'm sorry, in the winter before the shutdown, we had an old fashioned that funny enough, uh, your neighbor, uh, you never was the the main spirit but we added uh some barley soju from uh, miyazaki as well as some koji water uh and it was this wonderful rich kind of like savory uh savory cocktail that was super delicious and very umami forward so you know what we like to do especially as ryan talks about like his relationship working with chefs uh, we find so much inspiration from the culinary creative side. That's really what inspires me most about working at 11 Madison Park is that I have um, these, all these, these super talented chefs and I get to pick their brains about how flavors work. That's kind of how I came up with this like tahini umeboshi syrup. Uh, we were like, it came up with it and just, we thought it was an amazing, uh, delicious uh, syrup. And then um, you know, it's something like that that just like sparks a dialogue and then you fine tune in and then it becomes uh, a really cool idea that you're able to uh, just introduce people to something that you're really excited about. So I think that's, um, that's one of the things I miss right now with, with uh, lockdown is just being able to creatively, uh, you know, work with a team to get your expression or your particular vision out into uh, the public. Yeah, I mean, we, we work at a high level, but um, and, we, and we live in a bubble, uh, literally in bubbles, obviously, all in the cities where we are now. But Ryan, there's, you know, there's quite a long history in the fancy cocktail world of shochu and indeed places like Rocca and all that who, who hmm. you know, led the way in many ways and Hakkasan and whatnot. So things have changed a little recently, but generally, how do you judge the attitude of consumers to shochu in London and the knowledge level that they have? How do they, when they approach you and your bars, I mean? I think it's, you know, it's changing a lot. I think the, the awareness of it is, is, is still quite young. I think, you know, a lot of these uh, kind of both sake and shochu had been traditionally in kind of Japanese restaurants or Japanese, some of those bars that you mentioned before that would, you know, specializing in, in kind of uh, the, that range of products but i think the interest is really high people might not have the knowledge at the moment and you know they're they might have come across it in a couple of settings alongside some food but they're really curious to know more about it they've um you know tried it and been really interested in the profile and the the aspect of which it presents as a, as a new style of spirit um but i think when they see it on a menu that's where they want to ask some more questions so i think the beauty of having a cocktail bar is the ability to, to kind of present it in a slightly different way outside of those traditional serves of, of mixing it either with water or with, you know, serving it at different temperatures. Um, so I think it's a, it's a really nice position at the moment in London where people are very curious. You know, they're very excited to try new things. 
and they have that trust in in kind of the venues to to present it in a way that will resonate with them um and it, it's really nice you know we've been very fortunate with our venues that people come in and they are they are curious they want to try something new they they also want to to kind of understand our particular perspective on something so it's partly um relating it to the historic kind of uses of, of a certain spirit or a, or a certain way of serving but it's also trying to see how we'll interpret it and kind of position it in a slightly different way so we've been really lucky with it and it's really nice to see how uh, excited people get it's you know it is a different profile um and i think it, you know learning some of the history and you know learning where it's come from and the different styles that are available it's really spurring that curiosity in in our guests yeah and if you're tuning in we're going to be asking the same questions of mikey in sydney and diego in madrid as well to get a bit of a global perspective and it's worth pointing out that shochu itself was not always the best selling spirit in japan it's actually had its own boom in japan starting about 20 years ago when shochu kind of grew up from being a bit of a blue collar working class spirit to people really appreciating single pot still honkaku shochu and there's tons of innovative stuff happening now and it's gone parallel with scientific developments in terms of koji for instance traditionally as soon as black koji became available everyone stopped using yellow koji but of course yellow koji has now been you know edited bred genetically modified and whatever that it can produce you know just as much acid and flavor as anything else but hey i'm getting ahead of myself it's time for another cocktail right we're gonna nip over from london it's it's a short trip to madrid and we're gonna roll the video for diego cabrera of salmon guru's cocktail presentation let's play that video Hello guys, my name is Diego Cabrera from Salmon Guru in Madrid, Spain. My first cocktail is yellow chili. Uh, the inspiration for this cocktail was born after my trip to, to Japan, mixing different uh, kitchen techniques like osmosis. Okay, so we start with 5CL Sochu macerate with fresh ginger, cardamom and Thai chili. 3CL, simple syrup, and 4CL, fresh lemon. Touch of the egg white, and we shake. Super easy, super fast, perfect. Now, one Thai chili for decoration. And done. This is my first cocktail. Good morning or good evening, no matter where you are in the world. My name is Mikey M. Wright, and I'm here at the barber shop in Sydney, Australia. Um, today, um, I've got the great pleasure of making two Soshu style uh, cocktails. I had the opportunity a few years back to go to Japan and visit many distilleries down the southern parts um, that made Soshu. Uh, that was through the Japanese Sake and Soshu Association. It was an incredible experience. I hope some. Some of you out there get the opportunity like I had. So today, I'm gonna to make two cocktails, they're both stirred. I'm gonna do a martini style and then a gimlet. So, in fact, I'll actually start off with the gimlet first. So, the social I'm gonna to use today is, I, I won't even try to pronounce it, but it's called, uh, it's, trans, it's translated to Visitor Birds, um, which was a beautiful um, distillery. So, I'm gonna use 60 mils. Now, 
this has only got it's only um, 25% as well so it's actually quite a low style um, ABV style cocktail and then I'm gonna put my little Australian twist on it I'm gonna use 50 mils of a homemade uh, finger lime cordial and then I'm gonna give it two dashes of um, a salt bush distillate Just have, like a little bit of salt to it yeah. Right, I'm just going to leave that there, to get nice and nice and cold and start dilute, dilute, diluting. The next sake, uh, so, sushi I'm going to use is called Super Cool. Yeah, I thought it was a pretty cool name as well. So, this I'm going to do 30 mils. Now this has got, it's called Super Cool 33, because it's 33%. And then I'm going to use Kenobi Gin, I'm going to use 30 mils of this which is from the Kyoto Distillery. And then for our Australian twist, I'm going to use uh, five mils of uh, gelatin wax. Called, uh, it's a gelatin wax uh, distillate that we made. And, and also some Australian native lemongrass. Uh, distillate that we've made as well through our roast fat. And then I'm going to give it a little bit of a dash of green chartreuse. Beautiful handmade block from the Bourbon Company here in here in Sydney. And very simple. dilution in there and get it a little bit colder. Beautiful. So that's garnish it. I'm gonna just put um, some finger lime which is like a lime cavi uh, caviar on top of the block. So and then I'm going to use some, a little bit of floral to the to the martini, which is basically known as baby's breath. So there we go. Please enjoy. Thank you very much for having me. Well, I think I can speak for everybody who's not watching from Australia when I say I've definitely got a couple of questions about your ingredients, Mike. Some yeah. of them I recognize, no clue otherwise. But I wanted to uh, start with you, Diego. Delicious looking cocktails. And in Spain, there's actually quite a strong culture of Japanese restaurants. And there's people who are experts in 
Japanese spirits like our friend David Gonzalez Manzano. So what is the attitude of people about Japanese spirits when they come into uh, Salmon Guru? I think we need to unmute Diego so he can answer, by the way. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, yes, we have a very strong uh, Japanese culture here with uh, amazing, amazing restaurant. Always, no, it's, it's a style. It's more a uh, sushi, sushi bars, but the high, super high quality. You know, Spain or Madrid is the second fish market around the world after the Tsukishi market. You know, it's very here. The fish is the culture about the, the around the fish is super important. But about the about the cocktail, uh, the people come to 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 Samon Guru. Sorry, my daughter is around. <laughs> it's around. It's uh, daddy. I'm here. I'm here. Yes, I know, baby. Um, <laughs> the people when when come to 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 Salmon come to try to try. Uh, uh, Japanese whiskeys or maybe sakes, but now try uh, want to try um, a sochus, no different. People come, Diego, surprise me <sighs> again, again. <laughs> it's impossible, but not now because we have a different, different uh, products from around the world, like like uh, like sochu, different sochu from potato, from rice. From because uh, we are a very important distributor uh, in Spain with uh, with a big a big selection. No, it's not like uh, Japan, but for Spain is a is a, a very important important selection. And people, if you get somebody uh, ordering a shochu cocktail, how do you explain shochu to a Spanish person? Um. Okay, first, we don't explain. We uh, one a customer come uh, come in to to someone. Diego, hello, how are you? Surprise me. Okay, what do you want? Sour, refreshing, long drink, short, strong. Okay, I make one cocktail with uh, one spirit: the pisco, sochu, uh, whatever. If you like, I explain to you. If you like, if you don't like, I change fast. You know, normally the people like, but the sochu is a, is a is a is a big tool for us because the people don't know the flower. You know, when try what is this whiskey? What is this? Is no, I don't remember sake or maybe a one aging aging uh, sochu. It's a whiskey bourbon. It's it's confused for them, and uh, you know. Um, but we 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 make normally for the staff maybe um, one time at the month because we have um, a pop up menu that we change three of, or four times at, at the year. Um, we we make for the staff uh, testings, you know, because uh, the staff need to know the product to to prescribe or uh, to use in uh, new cocktails. And we make uh, for the customers. We make, <laughs> baby. We make uh, dinners with uh, food pairing, or or how do you say, uh, pagados, yeah. or tasting rooms for for the customers. Yeah. yeah, I think you've hit a really good point there. You can't lecture your customers. It's like the old joke, a mixologist is someone, when you ask him the time, he tells you how to build a clock. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's put that, that's it. You bring up some really good points, Diego. I wanna jump over to Mike. Mike, there's a huge Japanese population and influence in uh, Australia, of course. Yes. And I think some deep seated knowledge. And at Barbershop, you're very famous for the gin selection and you even you know snuck a bit of gin into your cocktail which is great shochu and gin are completely different products but are there similarities in the category in that before you drank gin you were old you'd been in the navy uh you drank really strong stuff like tanqueray and that was it and now it's opened up to everything there's pretty exciting things happening in shochu as well do you think it's there's some comparison between the categories 
Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, as gin has got more complex with, you know, different botanicals from around the world, I think, um, and also in different levels of sweetness, dryness, uh, floral earthiness, you know, and I think that when you look at Soshu, you know, it's got like such distinctive flavors to it, you know, like, you know, with sweet potato, we've got a slight smokiness to it. Um, and I just think that basically, you know, there is um, lots of different flavor there. So, and, and I do think it's quite versatile. Um, whilst I was doing the drinks, um, the 25% was quite hard because whenever I kind of put anything with it, you know, kind of whether it was a, a modifier, you know, like a citrus, it just seemed to drown out the taste of it. So I prefer the higher ABV and, and that's why I used the 33% in the martini. So, and also I used obviously a high ABV gin as well, just to make it quite strong. Um, but overall, I felt the flavors of, of the Soshu came out really well. Uh, absolutely. So, okay, it's time for the glossary of weird Australian ingredients. What is Geraldton wax? And why is it in my drink? <laughs> right, okay, it's a flower from um, WA. It's got like um, a honey scent and it and the citrus kind of finish to it is a lime. Um, we made it as a distillate. And we made a few actually, we made a finger lime, desert lime, sun, sunset lime, and also the Johnson wax. And I felt as a lime style distillate was the best one that came out. Um, so yeah, so I, I think, I felt like it went really well with the drink. And then I added some um, native lemongrass which is basically a like if which is quite significant right now because it's it used to be um part of an Aboriginal it was an Aboriginal medicine uh, which was for flu flu like symptoms <laughs> so but it also like not like Thai lemongrass that's very you know very heavy lemon and, and almost quite citronella I felt like it was just a little bit more um, medicinal sort of and not too sweet lemon kind of thing. Ah, good stuff. All right. Well, look, we've got all some of the world's best bartenders on this call. So I'm going to drop a bomb here, right? What's more, and I'm opening up to Matt, Diego, Ryan, Mike. What's more important, koji or your base ingredients in shochu? <laughs> <Oof. laughs> Who wants to bite first on that one? Wow. Well, I'm going to... I'm going to go with the camp of saying it's the the base material. I think the you know like the yeast and like you know the koji is a transformative element and it can only build on what's there before. Um, obviously, using different koji can take it in a different direction. So you can have two sweet potato shochu that 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 really start to di diverge. Um, and you know you're, you're building in those kind of later characteristics that you'll find in the final product. But I think. The real, the real difference to me when I'm looking to choose between different ones is, is, is the base material. Yeah, it's nice maybe to point out 90% of all the shochu that's sold in Japan is either barley or sweet potato, believe it or not. So, but there's, you can even make shochu from green chilies. <laughs> so I haven't tasted any, but you can. Yeah, I was kind of sat on the fence today. Um, I was researching it and reading a million and one articles. And I've just kept on coming back to the base ingredients, but obviously Koji makes such a significant part to the finish of it uh, from the findings today. And it is equally as important, but I agree with Ryan. It's, you know, it's about that initial flavor. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of research being done in Koji, the same technology we see being applied to yeasts. And yeah. it's having its moment in the sun because of you know great books coming out and the work of people like empirical CPH in Copenhagen who are lunatics, <laughs> read the uh, koji. Where do you stand on the question, Diego? For me, all is important in a cocktail, but obviously the koji is the is uh, the first step. No, it makes sense. And Matt, rounding it off with you, I think that you know, of course, it's the it's the ingredient you know and how and how it's processed and how it's grown a lot of a lot of what we're seeing on our trip in japan is that you know there was hands-on farming they were doing all this work uh for themselves they had farms connected to the distillery 
what was really interesting is that, you know, soshu can be distilled in a couple different ways with either uh, reduced pressure or atmospheric pressure. And that has a lot to do with the end result of the distillate, as well as how it's aged. You know, we talked a little bit about the Genshu, how it's resting in a uh, neutral cask for five years, uh, just to kind of let all those just ingredients settle and come together. Um, I've also seen, you know, at uh, Yaganita Distillery, you know, how he's able to utilize his still to uh, produce different pockets of heat to really kind of toast his, his you know, his wort inside uh, that still. So a lot of really cool techniques and expression that are happening from, you know, modern distillers today that are really pushing, you know, just like the whole platform to a new level that's completely expressive in different ways. So, yeah. Brilliant. All right. Well, we've been going for almost an hour now, so we kind of have to wrap it up. But a bit of rapid fire Q&A. We've got questions that came in on the chat on social media. So uh, I'm going to jump right in. So what is your favorite base material for shochu? Rice, sweet potato, something else? Ryan, I'll let you take that one. I, I'm a sweet potato fan. I think partly from when we took our trip and being able to to see the, the the kind of care that goes into harvesting and growing it and and then seeing the expression of the the profile afterwards i think it to me is a real great all-rounder it's got the right balance of the sweetness and some of those savory notes so it's it's the one i pick first yeah when i visited one time we actually got to uh try our hand at slicing up the sweet potatoes on a production line next to all these grannies and they smoked me. I sucked so bad at it. And <laughs> worst well, I, sweet I, I, I felt like I ruined some of their crop trying to get them out of the earth, let alone uh, get to the slicing of it. So, you know, I think that that skill, as you say, the, the care and the, the attention to detail and the expertise is that every chain, that was, that was one of the really amazing things to see firsthand. Yeah, the, just the, the attention to detail. I'll tell a quick story, actually. Um, we visited a tiny, tiny distillery together. And in our group was Dev Johnson, who's going to turn up in one of these seminars later on, from Employees Only in New York. And the distiller, the son of the founder, came out to greet us. And as a joke, he reached into his pocket and he pulled out a stack of Employees Only napkins and pretended to, like, you know, tab his head. He had been to Employees Only five years before. And he kept those napkins <laughs> every single day. He, he got a visitor. It's like, is it somebody from EO? No. <laughs> and after five years, five years, finally, somebody turned up. All right, uh, hang on a second. What is your favorite simple shochu cocktail? Diego, what do you think? For me, Okay, one of the more, my favorite cocktails is a shimblet. Shim, if you if you make shimblet with sochu, uh, with sochu, with a uh, sugar cane sochu or sweet potato sochu, is amazing, amazing. If you put a drop of the, um, uh, I don't remember uh, the bitter rhubarb bitter. If you put say, le, uh, uh, lime. But, uh, uh, sugar cane or sweet potato sochu and rhubarb bitter, a drop, shake it. Wow, it's amazing. Excellent. Glad to hear it. There's definitely a bit of a theme for shochu gimlets today. <laughs> and then, well, it's a bit of a, bit, a leading question. Um, Matt, I'm going to give it to you. You're our official ambassador from the world of fine dining. Um, is shochu more suited to food pairing, especially the stuff that's maybe less than 80 proof or 40%? I think so. I think that what's really great about soshu is, especially with the barley soshu that I, I particularly like to uh, mix with more than the sweet potato, it has this really nice umami characteristic, which is something that we're trying to incorporate a lot in, into uh, our program at 11 Madison Park. We like to expand on flavors. So I find that, you know, Soshu for the most part, you know, when I'm building cocktails, I like to use it as an accent with lower ABV things. So as like, um, I've had a lot of uh, 
positive results using it in like a bamboo type setting, you know, a stirred drink with something like a Montiato Sherry or like a uh, something like Pomo it has like wonderful rich flavor that the Soshu can really add this wonderful grounding note to the cocktail. I think that um, it's super expressive and I think that you could utilize it in the right, in the right um, relationship and it's not overpowering that it won't overpower someone's meal. You know, at 11 Madison Park, it's totally focused on the tasting menu. And so we really try hard to make sure that the, the cocktails do not overpower the experience of the tasting menu. So we really focus on the balance of making sure drinks are not super spirit forward. They're balanced and complex and delicious. Uh, and I think that Soshu has a lot to offer in that category. Fantastic. All right. Well, look, I think we have to wrap this up now because I've had two small glasses of shochu, so I'm going to have to go back to bed for a nap. But this has been marvelous. I want to thank you, Matt, Ryan, Mike, Diego, and everybody at the Japan Sake and Shochu Makers Association. Please tune in on November 16th. We'll be doing this again with the great and mighty Juris Kennens from Barron's Bar in Riga, Latvia, and Odd Strandbakken from the multiple award-winning Himcock Bar in Oslo. We'll be talking about different serves of shochu. This whole session is going to be available on the JSS Shochu Instagram account, which is at JSS underscore shochu. That's at JSS underscore showed you as an Instagram TV highlight so you can watch it again. Hell, we might even put it on YouTube. But for now, thank you for joining us on the Shochu Educational Webinar, number one of eight. On behalf of everybody here in London, New York, Sydney, Tokyo, and Madrid. Come by. <laughs>